saying, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. CERN, C-E-R-N, the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, started a project to accelerate charged particles. Ten days later, photographer Christophe Suarez posted a series of photographs of the skies above CERN. Those jaw-dropping photos showed the formation of strange clouds and were proof that the biggest experiment in the world is about to tear a portal into another universe open. Up until now, we've only seen such incidents in the movies. But now, after witnessing it in reality, people are not only concerned but scared if the scientists have actually found a way to open a portal to another world. We're accelerating protons in opposite directions to very high energies in a 27 kilometer long tunnel and then we bring them to collisions in different interaction points where we have an experiment. What are you hoping to achieve here? Well, these collisions essentially are at very high energy, at the highest possible energy mankind has generated in particle physics collisions so far, and we hope to achieve conditions which must have existed very close to the beginning of our universe. There is theories out there which suggest that these microscopic black holes could be produced in high energetic proton-proton collisions. And if we indeed find first signs of these microscopic black holes, then this could open the path to new extra dimensions in our universe. Einstein made scientific history by recognizing that we really live in four dimensions by adding time to the mix. Time is a physical property. We know that we live in at least ten, that's the current uh, uh, dimensions. Four of them are directly, uh, uh, we can experience them. But we know there are six others that we can't get at directly, but we know they, we, by, we can infer their existence mathematically. What makes that provocative to people who've discovered that is that a Hebrew sage by the name of Nachmanides back in the 13th century uh, predicted that from studying the text of Genesis. He concluded that our universe has 10 dimensions, only four are knowable to use his term, and six are not knowable to us. And I find that fascinating because we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on atomic accelerators to discover what Nachmanides did by studying the text. So the ten, some say eleven. There's some debates among mathematicians about details, but there's awareness within the advanced scientific community that there that we live in more than just the four dimensions that we directly experience. And uh, that in Genesis three, when God declares war because of the fall of man, the creation was made subject to the bondage of decay, the entropy laws, and all of that. Apparently, were part somehow tied to. God's curse on the cre everything we know about the creation is post curse. Prior to the curse, it may have had ten dimensions, and for some, we was fractionated. So that some of us tend to regard those six inaccessible dimensions as the domain of things like angels. The book of Revelation opens up the future for us. So in Revelation chapter number nine and verse one. The scripture says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. 
and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Preach you a message about something that is happening right now while you're sitting in this auditorium. It's in CERN, Switzerland. Now you may not be aware of what's going on over there, but there's a thing over there that's called a Large Hadron Collider. And it is an accelerator. It accelerates particles and then brings them to the point of collision. So this Large Hadron Collider was started up just a few days ago and it's still in the initial process of being brought online completely. You say, what in the world does something like that have to do with me and the Bible? It has a lot to do with you and the Bible. There is a 17 mile long accelerator that lies 300 feet beneath the surface of the ground. This area is where France and Switzerland come together. So part of this accelerator is located in France and part of it in Switzerland. It is a joint European project. The United States of America is there as an observer, but the, but the brain power that's going in to this experimentation originates in Europe. They are attempting to recreate what they believe happened that brought all of this into existence as being the Big Bang. Now you and I know from the book of Genesis chapter number one that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. He spoke it into existence. They are finding things, and this is what's important for us to understand today. They are discovering things that they did not expect to discover as they get deeper and deeper into this, uh, into this experimentation and uh, development and research and so forth. They are beginning to find out that there is a whole lot more to the creation than they had ever given thought to before. Here we have in CERN, Switzerland, a huge wheel. Inside that wheel is a Hindu God and his name is Shiva. He does a dance of destruction inside that wheel and his purpose is he is one of the triad gods, one of the greatest gods of Hinduism, Shiva, Vishnu, and Brahma. Brahma is the god of creation. Vishnu is the god of preservation, but Shiva is the god of destruction. The way the Hindu sees it is that when Shiva destroys, it's not for the purpose of annihilation. He destroys so that Brahma can come and recreate. So now when the Hindu, since they're scientists to CERN, they put this out there in front. And so what these people are doing with the collider is destroying what comes together, but for the purpose of recreating and find out what brought it into existence to begin with. Are you following me? Yeah. Now here we have men that are scientists on an average of an IQ of anywhere from 160 to 200 or even above. These are some of the smartest brains in all the world. No, that's no question about it whatsoever. I pick up physicists and try to read some of this stuff. I think, good night. Forget me. That's for, a, that's for a brain that is wired that way. No question. But we were told when Darwin's theory of evolution came out and became vogue, that it would destroy the foundations of Christianity. And this old book that we hold in our hands, this old outdated Bible would no longer be relevant. And a lot of people bought into it because after all, Darwin is scientific. But it's an amazing thing now that 150 years later, we have some of the greatest scientists in the world that are becoming very religious because here they've got Shiva, they've got dances to Shiva, and they are definitely being connected with Shiva as they're finding things. Let me give you one example. In one of their collisions, when they collided these particles together, they saw things. They were apparitions. They didn't expect to see, and they didn't fit in any model. They didn't fit anywhere. They don't belong, but they, they could not deny the reality of it. Something was going on inside there that they could not explain. And it was scary for them. For the scientist has his paper and his pencil and his books. And if it doesn't fit in his paper and his pencil and his books, it's out the window. 
They don't understand. They have a hard time accepting the fact that there is a spirit world out there. That spirit world was created by a spirit being. An almighty, eternal, absolute being that is from everlasting to everlasting who put in me what I am today by the power of Almighty God and by the power of the new birth. But a scientist like that will never admit that because that takes it out of his control. And his so keep your head up. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. No, don't you give up.